Lift your name on high Lord, I'd love to see your praises oh, I'm so glad you're in my life and I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth To show the way From the earth to the cross My dear to pay From the cross to the grave Grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Oh, I'm so glad you're in my life. And I'm so glad you came. To save us, you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. I dare to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Oh, I lift your name on. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. I dare to pay. Cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. 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 Lift your name on high. We lift your name on high. Lift your name on high. Lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death. To pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on oh, you. Came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. I dare to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on oh, high. Yes, Lord, we lift your name on high. Praise you, Jesus. He's so good. The Bible says he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself to the place on the cross for us. And I don't know about you, but I want to know him more. He invites us to abide in him, and he said he would abide in us. When the secret, when the quiet place In the stillness you are there He's there When the secret, when the quiet hour I wait only for you I want to know you more oh, I want to know you And I want to hear your voice I want to know you more oh, I want to touch you 
the price. Pressing onward, pushing every hindrance aside. Well, on my way, cause I want to know. hear your voice. Lord, you still speak today. You still speak to your people. We have soft ears to hear your voice. Oh, Lord. Jesus, we love you. And we know you love us. Jesus, we love you, Lord. Jesus. Just say to him, I want to know you, Lord, I want to hear your voice, I want to know you more, precious Savior, I want to touch you, I want to see your face, I want to know I know that you're alive, you came to fix my broken life, and I sing to glorify your holy name, oh Jesus Christ, oh Lord. blood that you shed on the cross when you died for the sins of man and you let out a cry crucified now alive in me these hands are yours Teach them to serve as you please And now reach out Desperate to see all the greatness of God May my soul rest assured in you I'll never be the same oh, 
be the same Cause I know You're alive You came to fix My broken life And I sing To glorify Holy name Jesus Christ changed it all you broke down the wall when i spoke and confessed in you i'm blessed now i walk in the light in victorious sight of you and i'll never be the same be the same, cause I know that you're alive, you came to fix a broken life, and I sing to glorify holy name for Jesus Christ, cause I know No, I sing to glorify your holy name, Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, come. Jesus, the fire fall down your fire fall down on us we pray come lord jesus as we seek your fire fall down your fire fall down on us we pray oh as we seek your fire fall down your fire fall down desire as we seek your fire fall down your fire fall down on us we pray lord as we seek your fire fall down your fire fall down on us we Come like a rushing wind, Lord, we want to see you, we want to feel you, we want to seek you, oh Lord, all of our days, oh, as we seek your fire, fall down your fire, fall down on us, we pray. I want to see 
your heart, Lord. I want to walk in your ways. I want to see your glory, Lord, just like Moses said. I want to see you, Lord, your glory. When we see you, Lord, when we encounter you, we're never the same. Oh, Lord, we're changed. When we hear you, when we feel you say, I love you, my son, my daughter. When you say, I know every single thing you've done. And I love you. You're so precious to me. My thoughts towards you are more than can be counted, more than can be measured. Oh God, you're so, so good. And we just want more of you, Lord. Lord, even though sometimes things get in the way, we get in the way, Lord. Your word says, he who started a good work in you will see it to completion. Lord, you see us to completion because you love us. You take our hand and you walk with us. Jesus, we love you. What it will be like when I walk by your side. Imagine, I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face, beautiful face, is before me. I can only imagine. Jesus, or not, you be still. Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees, will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Only imagine when the day comes and I find myself standing in the sun. Oh, I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. Oh, I can only imagine. Surrounding my own glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or not, you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing? Hallelujah! Will I be able to speak at all? I can only. Jesus. 
We are continuing our uh, series on what we call Jesus in the Age of Rage. And we're taking this from 1 John and we're comparing kind of the extremes. John uses extremes. He, he uses light and darkness. He, he uses uh, Christ and Antichrist. And this morning we come to a very difficult passage of Scripture, probably one of the most difficult passages where John uses these these two extremes, where there's the children of God and the, the children of the devil. And it's like, whoa, what? Wait a minute. Where is he coming from? And so we're going to look at that from 1 John. But before we do, I want to just tell you a little story about zebras. Okay? Zebras are cool. And when we were in Uganda, we came upon a herd of zebras. And they, they run in a herd and there's a, a herd of, of zebras right there, and uh, they, are, they are so different, and yet they are so similar to horses. The thing with zebras is, like, they all look the same. I, I mean, they're black and white. Th that's it. I mean, horses, you know, you got white ones and brown ones and black ones, and then you've got all different kinds of uh, in-between mixed up. You could, you could pretty much tell a horse, but a zebra, I mean, it's just, it's like God only had two crayons when he made the zebra, you know, a black one and a white one. I mean, how creative is that, right? And so when, when you're looking at a zebra, you think about it. You're, you're a lion or you're a tiger and you're crouched down there in, uh, in, the, in the thicket and you're watching through the grass and you come, you know, you're watching this, this whole herd of zebras and, and all you can see is like, Black and white stripes moving around, you know. It's like, which one's a zebra? Uh, which, which what, what are we looking? Which one? What, is this that one? No, it's that one. No, it's that one. I mean, it's got to be confusing. It's got to be confusing. And that's what researchers found when they were studying herds of zebra. They were they were watching these zebra, and they were like, oh, I can't tell which one we were watching just five minutes ago. Was it that one over there or that one over there? They, they couldn't tell the difference. So, so the researchers who were researching zebras and they, they wanted to find out the, the habits of zebras, they thought, we got to tell these guys apart. And so they got a can of paint, you know, and they painted a big, a big circle on, on the side of this zebra. And, or they, they got really sophisticated and they put one of those great big yellow tags in its ear so they could tell them apart. And they thought, there, this is better. Now we, now we can distinguish our, our test subject, our zebra, from the rest of the herd. But they found something out quite quickly was the zebra that they marked was the zebra that was killed and eaten by the predators. Yeah. And, and so every time they marked a zebra, it got killed and eaten. And they realized that the lions and the tigers and, and the predators aren't picking off the ones at the back of the herd that are sick because they're at the back of the herd and the sick. They found out that they were picking those ones off because they could distinguish them. They stood out from the rest of them. That's the only way that they could, they could catch themselves a zebra. And psychologists got a hold of this and they thought, hey, uh, humans are kind of like that too. I mean, we don't say, well, we're, we're together as a herd, but we use another word. We use the word tribe, don't we? And, and, and when you're in a certain tribe, for, so there's the doctor tribe. I mean, doctors have their own tribe. 
And, and you know it's your own tribe because they have their own language, right? And they have their own ideas and they have their own learning and they have their own, their own college of physicians and they have to meet their own standards. And so doctors are all in their own tribe, but we, we know from history that when a doctor starts to do things differently in history, they were marked in that tribe and they were oftentimes attacked. So if a doctor did something differently, like suggested that before I operate on you, I should wash my hands. It's true. They were like, this doctor's crazy. He's not one of us. Or we should sterilize our instruments. Why would you need to do that? Pfft. What a crazy doctor. And it, it took time for these guys because they stood out. And so people in churches even stand out. You know, you go to some churches and this is the way you dress and this is the way you behave. And other churches, is, well, this is how you think and this is what you say and this is when you stand. And this is when you sit down. And you know you're not a part of the tribe because when, when, they, when everybody stands, you're still sitting down. And when everybody sits down, you're still standing up. You don't know what to do. And, and so you know, it, you, what, you stick out, right? You stand out. And in the age of rage, here's what's happening, is that people are becoming so polarized and so far apart that, that people stand out and they're often, they're often attacked. They're often maligned. Uh, they're often marginalized by people on the other side. We see it all the time in, on TV. We see it all the time on social media. You hear it all the time, even in people's conversations. And in Canada, there is, there is this increase of intolerance, even against people who believe in the Lord, even in churches. It was last summer, over 50 churches were burned down. Christians are continually maligned in Western legacy media. And so the question today that, that John confronts us with is, how do we be the children of God? How do we live out our faith in a hostile world? How do we conduct ourselves in public when there's so much intolerance? And how do we relate to other people in our culture when we live in what we call today a, a canceled culture? And so John's going to, to make this distinction. And there's some difficult scriptures here that Christians really struggle with they struggle with the teaching here, and so we're going to walk through that. But my sermon in a sentence is this, that we counter the hate, hatred in the world with love, faith, purity, generosity, and hope. Let those be the things that mark us. Let those things be the things that cause us to stand out in this world. Let's look at the distinguishing marks of the child of God. First John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, it says this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Every time I read that word lavished, I think of peanut butter and the thickness that I put on a piece of bread. I lavish it. All right. This is how much God loved us. He lavished his love on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what uh, we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Wasn't that great? I wanted that song, only imagine, I wanted them to put it at the end because this just relates to this scripture, right? We really don't know. We can only imagine what we will be. But we do know we will be like Jesus when he appears. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Now the verses we're looking at today in 1 John are among the most difficult to understand in the New Testament especially if we just pluck them out of where they are and don't read them within the scope of the, of the whole New Testament. However, there's important theology that we need to understand in order to really understand what John is saying here. And some of the things that John is saying here is, is when we come to this word child of God, no one is born a child of God. See, because John is making a distinction. 
We are the children of God, and they are not the children of God. So no one is born a child of God. We become God's children through our faith and through the love that God has lavished upon us. Now, there's a, not a lot of people that actually believe that. Most people believe, and in the world, you'll hear it, people will say, well, we're all children of God. Everybody's a child of God. And there are many people in the church that believe that as well. Well, everybody's a child of God. But, but this is not what the Bible teaches about the children of God. All people are created and created equally before God. But being called a child of God shows there is a distinct relationship between you and God, between you and Jesus. There is a distinct relationship. And in fact, John points that out and says, you know, they don't know who you are because they don't know who he is. See, there's that lack of relationship to those folks that would not be the child of God. The world does not know him, therefore the world does not understand us. Now, the New Testament uses a word that is very familiar to you and I to, to, to talk about people who are the children of God, and it uses the word adoption. So it gives us this picture that before we received Christ, before we became Christians, we were orphaned. We were not in relationship with our Creator, but when we come to know Him through Jesus Christ, we are adopted by him. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 says, the spirit, the Holy Spirit you received brought about your, what's that word? Adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, and that word is a, is, is a word that simply means daddy. By him we cry out, daddy God. There's another verse that John uses in, in his gospel, the gospel of John, the very first chapter of the gospel of John. He says, he says, and as many as received him, he's talking about Jesus, as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God. And so in, in John's idea and in the New Testament idea of children of God, it is those people that are in relationship with their creator through Jesus Christ. And we come to that relationship because, because of our faith. And we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose again from the grave. We, we take our faith and, and we put that faith into the, our action and we receive him and as we do that, God responds by love, with lavishing his love upon us and accepts and adopts us as his children. Barclay writes this, and I like what Barclay says. It says, when Jesus came into the world, he was not recognized as the son of God. The world preferred its own ideas and rejected his. The same is bound to happen to anyone who chooses to embark on the way of Jesus Christ. So it should be no surprise that we live in a world of rage that becomes intolerant, that, that becomes uh, uh, tired, that becomes angry at us as Christians. But because of God and God's love, we're commanded to love one another. Here, here's what Jesus says in John 15, 17 to 8. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another, then he adds this, and this is very important. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. So there is this divide, and John is showing us that there is this, this division, this, this war, this intolerance between the, the children of God and, and the rest of the world. Jesus said, you know, if you're going to be like me, you got to realize you're going to be that zebra with the mark on it. You're going to be that zebra with the mark. You're going to stand out in your world. And they didn't like me much. And they're not going to like you much either. Being a child of God means, uh, again, it, it means more than having your sins forgiven. But it means we live a life of purity. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. 
So being a child of God is, is living a life of moral integrity and purity. It's being like Jesus. Again, John says in John, uh, 1 John 3 and 3, he says this, All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So forgiveness is God's reaction to his love. We have nothing to do with God's forgiveness. That's a reaction of God to his love. So that is, your, your salvation does not produce forgiveness. It produces purity and fruit. In other words, a mark of somebody who is a child of God is a transformed and changed life. That is being transformed in the likeness of Christ. That is becoming morally pure. That is becoming a person of character. And that's why we have, we teach character. Because it's no, you know, it's no good to say you're a Christian and then you're walking around and your character is in the, in the, in the garbage can. This, this is what John is coming against. He's saying you can't, you can't walk around claiming to be a Christian and be a person of low character. There has to be a transformation and a change in your life. And we don't see that in the church because we've accepted that being a Christian and the fruit of Christianity is walking in freedom and forgiveness. And that is not the fruit of Christianity. That is the result of being a child of God. You didn't do anything for that. God just gave it to you for free. The fruit of Christianity is being transformed by Jesus Christ and not walking according to the dictates of your culture. And we have become so much like our culture that you can't tell the difference. And that's because we've accepted a lie. We're not living as child of God. We're living like we're still out in the world. And John is saying that doesn't jive. It doesn't jive with the word of God. It doesn't jive with the spirit that lives within you. Oh, we're going to get into that. It doesn't jive with being God's child. So we don't walk by the culture. See, we live in a culture that calls good evil. It calls evil good. But as followers of Jesus, we do not walk by the standards of that culture. And believe me, you will have people that will become very angry and intolerant when you don't agree with what they believe. You're going to face that. And child of God, okay, so children of God also have a positive outlook on life. It says, when he appears, we will be like him. We live every day to its fullness. We look forward to tomorrow because we know who is the author of tomorrow. We have a positive look out on life. We are positive and we walk in positive faith and hope in the present. We have positive faith and hope in the future that God has things under his control and in his hands. And we walk in a positive outlook of eternity. We can only imagine, but we know we will be like him. And so like one of those zebras that stand out for the herd, we become a follower of Jesus. Our faith makes us stand out. We believe in him. Our love makes us stand out, that we operate on the basis of love. Our purity makes us stand out, that we don't accept the dictates of our culture and the standards of the world. Our hope stands out and it distinguishes us from the hope that is out there in the world, rather to a living hope in a relationship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are what distinguishes us as children of God. Now, what distinguishes the mark of the children of the devil? Ooh, that sounds serious, doesn't it? The children of the devil. I mean, who are these, who are these vampires? Do they drink blood? Do they eat babies? <laughs> are they like zombies, immortal, walking around, uh, looking for humans to devour? Who are these spawn of the devil? Well, let's find out. John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. This is how we know who the children of God are and who are the children of the devil. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Whoa. Ho, ho, ho. Nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Wow. Are these difficult? Are you kidding? What is John doing here? Oh, you know, you hear those verses and, and there's, 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 three, there's three different kinds of people. There's people that say, well, you know what? John doesn't really mean what he means, what he says. He doesn't mean, I believe what John says, John means. Okay, that's what. Then there's other people that will read that and they'll read that and go, I can never be a Christian. I'm just not good enough. 
And that's not what they're written for. And there's other people that read that and go, ho, 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 ho. Well, you're not of God and you're not of God and you're of the devil. Okay, I'm not pointing at anybody in particular, just to let you know. So <laughs> why does John give, a, why does John write like this? And, and I think it's because, and it, I think it's because when he looked out at the church in his age, he saw that there were some people who were like, well, you know what? I'm just, I know Jesus is my savior, but I'm not really just serving him right now. I'm, I, I, I need to wait. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a bad person. I'm a good person. But I'm just not ready yet to give my full life to Jesus. And you know what John is doing here? He is stealing our middle ground. It's like if you want to sit on the fence, John just tore down the fence. It's just like that Bob Dylan song, you know, you got to serve somebody. We were going to sing that this morning, and then I thought, well, maybe we better not. But, but, you know, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you don't have a choice here. You have to serve somebody. There's no middle ground. In other words, in this world, there is no Switzerland. You can't be neutral. You can't say, well, you know, I kind of like being, I don't want to choose a side yet. I'm, I'm, I'm having too much fun. John says, that, that can't happen. It's either going to be Jesus or it's the devil. You can't do both. And so he's saying it's impossible to serve God and serve our own sinful, sinful nature. Here's what he says, 1 John. We'll continue reading this difficult passage, 1 John 3, 5 to 6. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. Good news! And in him is no sin. So no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. And he's basing this on relationship. Now, Commentators are really quick to point out and say, you know what, this is, is not talking about the person who, who makes a mistake and, and sins. It's talking about a person who comes and says, I want to follow Jesus, and then continues in that pattern and lifestyle of habitual sin. That's what he's talking about. Here's another zinger from John. Zingers from John. That would make a great servant title. Zingers from John. First John 3 verse 8. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. <laughs> because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. You, you, you see how, how inconsistent it would be for me to say, Oh, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to live over here for a while because, you know, I'm just not quite ready to follow Jesus as Lord. John would say, that's impossible. Now, when I was a young pastor, I, I was... Very young, wet behind the ears, and I just knew that when I came to church, everybody would love me. And, and I came into this church, and everything was great, and there was this one fella, and he was telling everybody in the church that I wasn't of God. He was, he was walking around church, go, you know, he's not of God. He's of the devil, the devil put him in here. <laughs> he, it never dawned on him that, that his lack of love and his slander was probably of the devil, but you see, this does not give us the right to say to anybody, to judge anybody, that person's not of God, or that person's of the devil. Boy, I'd like to take that kind of talk right out of the church and right out of Christian's vocabulary. He says, it doesn't belong there. John writes these things like, like many of the verses of the Bible. Is, it, it is written for us so that the Holy Spirit can take it and can use it to speak to our own hearts and lives. So it's not that we have the right to look down our noses at somebody else and say, well, they're not of God. It doesn't give us a license to point a condemning finger at anybody and declare that they are of the devil. But rather, it gives the Holy Spirit a, an open door to come into our lives and say, you know, <clears throat> The way you're thinking there, that's not the way God wants you to think. You know what you're doing there? That's not really what God wants you to be doing. And it's for you and the Holy Spirit to have that conversation about things in your life. John wrote these verses to tell us that Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil in our lives. John is taking away the middle ground, but he's also opening a door for our freedom, for our healing, and for our forgiveness. 
Whatever harm, this is great, this is a great verse. Whatever harm, whatever damage, whatever destruction sin has done in your life, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and to completely heal you. And everybody say amen. 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 And so John says this in 1 John chapter 8, verse 8 to 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. We, we've got to come to that point where, hey, you know what? We make mistakes every day. And, 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 and John is not saying we're just condemned to be of the devil. That's not the way it is. But if we say we have no sin, we, we, we deceive ourselves. We've sinned every day. But here's how the rest of that verse goes. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, here's another zinger from John. Jesus appeared that he may take away sin. John does not condemn us. He lifts us up and says, man, you guys can be free. Man, you guys can walk on top of this world, not beneath it. Man, you guys can live a life of purity and you do not have to be yanked around by the devil anymore. Those chains are broken and you can know true freedom in Jesus. No one is born of God, John says, continues to sin because God's seed remains in him. It is impossible to have a relationship with Jesus and continue to sin. God says, uh, John says, God's seed remains in you. See, when you became a Christian, God planted a seed in you. And it's a seed that grows. Jesus used the the uh, analogy of a seed where he talks about the farmer going out to sow seeds into the world, right? And those seeds take root in the hearts of men and women. That seed has taken root in your heart. If you call yourself a Christian today, if you consider yourself a believer, that seed has taken root in your heart. God, that's what John says in, in chapters uh, 3, verse 9. He says, the one who's born of God will, continue, will, will not continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They've been born of God. And Jesus tells us that we have this, this seed, this, this, this life growing in us that will produce the fruit of faith and love and purity and joy and hope. Jesus also warns us that that seed can die if it's not looked after, if it's not taken care of, if we don't feed it. Satan will steal the seed if we allow our heart to become hard. Sin will choke the seed out and the seed will wither and the new life that the Holy Spirit has placed in you will die if you don't nurture the work of God in our lives. The world is a hostile place for God's seed. James says this about the world, 4 verse 4, friendship with the world means enmity, war with God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So we fight this war every day. I do. I know that. There's a war every day between, between my, my flesh, my, myself, my, my selfish desires, and what God wants to do in me. There's a war every day between evil that's out there in the world and what God wants to accomplish with me. And this war is real. Now, John, 1 John, as we read down, I'm not going to read all of it, but he uses an illustration from the Old Testament of Cain and Abel. Does anybody, what, what happened between Cain and Abel? Does anybody remember what happened between, what did Cain, who? Abel killed his brother Cain? No. Good. Cain, but bad. Cain killed his brother Abel, right? I mean, it was one generation after the fall. I mean, mom and dad fail and the kids are killing each other. That's how Satan works, right? And, and so John uses Cain and Abel. And he, he says, you know, it's, it's like Cain. And he, he warns us as we live in this world, he says, don't be like Cain. Don't be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because of his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. So John is just kind of bringing this around. He says, you know what, folks? When you go out there, you are in a war. 
You have a choice to make every day. Am I going to live as a child of God or I'm going to go out there and I'm going to live as a child of the devil? And you're in this war and, and here's Cain. Cain chose. Cain made, made a choice. In fact, I read this the other day in my devotion. And God comes to Cain and says, Cain, you have a choice. You have a choice. And Cain chose to be a follower of the devil and kill his brother. You have a choice every day. I have a choice every day. And the application is, hey, if you make the right choice and follow God, don't be surprised if you find that the world hates you. Don't be surprised when, the, when you find that the world singles you out, when they've marked you, when you're persecuted or marginalized. We can't compromise with sin. We need to confess our sins. And maybe you've never done that. It's very simple. Just confess your sins. Just confess them to God. We need to repent. That means to just turn away. And when we do, when we do that, God responds to that with forgiveness. And then the Lord leads us and he becomes the boss of our lives. Today I choose. I choose in this world to counter the hatred that this world has with love and faith and purity and generosity and truth. I choose to be that person. And some days that's a difficult choice because I got to battle my own flesh. I've got to battle my own thoughts. So it comes down to this, and I'm going to share this last, last couple of verses with you. First John 3, 16 to 18. This is then how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and with truth. John says, don't love just with words and speech. I think words and speech are really important. And, and I, I think that every time we have something come out of our mouth, it ought to be grace. It ought to be with grace. But speech, John says, speech is just not enough. It's just not enough. That, that it has to be turned into action. So he says, not just speech, but actions. That's what we have above our door, love and action. That's kind of our vision, our marching orders. Our mission is to put love into action. So we live a life of love, and we live a life of purity. We live a life of generosity. And then John uses one other thing. that We go out in the world, we live in truth. And that means that we don't compromise our life with sin. We don't compromise our life in being like the world, but rather we live in a way that we want to serve God. We make that choice every day. I'm going to serve Jesus. I am a child of God. That's why we have things. That's why we have a, a community center to give people in our congregation an opportunity to put their love in action. In, in our community center, you know, yesterday, uh, downtown, we were in conjunction with a, a group uh, from Windsor, came with, with tons of vegetables, gave everything away for free downtown. We did that again here when we did a clothing swap. You should have seen the, the first floor. It was all clothes separated into the sizes and all kinds of families coming in. And every family that got to come in, they could just take what they needed. And then they got as much vegetables, big trays of vegetables to take home. Stuff like that. Stuff like in our, our children's ministry where they've done things like on Wednesdays, they had, a, they, they had a, a, a fun day. But everybody that came, all the families that came, they all went home with school supplies that you guys supply. See, this is a part of putting love in action. This is a part of not just saying we're Christians, but going a step further and putting love into action and showing it. And we, we're still putting together those supplies and we're going to give those to families that, that need them uh, come the fall. We put love in action by 
by sitting down with kids if, and, and tutoring them. You don't have to be a teacher to do that, but you need to have a couple of hours and you need to know how to read, <laughs> but <laughs> it helps. Um, but to, to help those kids with their schoolwork after school and uh, their parents drop them off here and, and they get tutored. Uh, there's all kinds of things. And you know, the best thing is to ask God to show you areas where you can be the child of God where you can combat this world with love and faith and generosity and purity and go farther than just what you say, but putting love in action and living the truth in your life so that other people can see it. Let's stand together as we close our service in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Maybe you're listening to me on the internet, and I know this has been a sermon that's been difficult. We've walked through some of the most difficult uh, verses in the New Testament. And if the Holy Spirit has convicted your heart, then you need to respond to him and open your heart and say, Spirit of God, come in and, and speak to me. Maybe there's areas in your life where the Holy Spirit has said, you know what, that's, that's not what God wants you to do. That's not of God. Maybe there's areas in your life where where the Holy Spirit is, is urging you on to step out and to, to put your love into action. Maybe, there's, maybe in your life, you're on the fence. You're, you're, you're kind of trying to carve out that comfortable place where you're not really serving God and you're not really a bad person. And you think, well, I can be comfortable there. But John has taken that away from you today and says, you need to make a choice. Who are you going to serve? Maybe you're in a difficult situation right now, and it is a battle every day to be that person who is loving, to, to walk as that person in faith, to walk in that person that is showing generosity and kindness. And it's a battle every day, but every day you need strength to make that choice to do what God would have you to do. And I want to pray for you today that God would minister to you, that the Holy Spirit of God would strengthen you, and that you would make the choice that you are a child of God, that you would receive Jesus and ask him to come into your lives and just proclaim it to him. I am your son. I am your daughter. I am yours, Lord. I am your child. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.